The first item on the uh, agenda. Tell them it's recorded. Yeah, this meeting is being recorded, just so everybody knows. Um, and the first item is approving the May minutes. So we hope that everybody had a chance to look at those. With that said, I'll be looking for a motion, and then we can approve those I meeting minutes. that we approve the May minutes. Second. Okay, so let's vote. Approving the May minutes. Good. Unanimous. Right. Unanimous. Uh, the first item, solar, landfill, senior center, uh, any solar updates? Michael, you get this? Um, yes. Uh, on the landfill first, um, the uh, Carolyn, the town administrator, has uh, requ initially requested a pre-application submittal the services for a pre-application submittal uh, from um, Nick at Sunbug, which is now a larger company whose name I can't remember. And he declined to do it because mm -hmm. they I'm just had some way. changes and you know they're a larger entity now and they didn't want to do it. So we now have asked um, Solar Design Associates, which is, I think, in Lexington or they're out east a little ways near Boston. What is it called? Solar Design Associates. Haskell Whirlin um, is the one of the main people there, and he's been doing solar for, you know, since before there was solar. <laughs> he's been doing solar for a while, and I think, I think his company put the first panels on Jimmy Carter's White House back whenever that was. Wow. Um, so anyway, they have agreed to do it, um, and they're in the process of doing the initial pre-application, and, and, and so that is moving forward. So the monies that were approved for doing that pre-approval, yeah, that should cover it? Um, I think $1,000 in total. The, the application to, to uh, Everest, Eversource costs about a little under 400 bucks to okay. do the pre-application and hopefully they're going to be able to do what they're doing for you know some, somewhere around five hundred dollars and um, it's a very very initial step and what it does is the utility company will come back to us and say highly unlikely they're going to come back and say oh yeah no problem right. Everything, all the lines are great just go ahead and start it what they're very likely to do is say um, there are these issues that we've identified that need to be upgraded in addition to running a line from the three-phase electricity to Route 9, you will have to do these improvements to our substation or in, in accordance with our needs, right. basically. Okay. And then so that will give us a clearer idea of what the costs are and then we can go from there and, and figure out whether, it's, whether it makes sense or not um, once we have that information. It will be, you know, it'll be the next step. So any idea how long the it'll take before we have the results of the pre-application? Um, I, I, I don't know. I think it, I think it varies. So um, could it months, I would imagine. It could um, be like as much as a year, you think? I, I think it could be as much as six to 12 months. It's just in, in my head yeah. um, in terms of how long it might take. Okay. Um, that's not that bad. That's not that bad. Uh, the, you know, the entire process is a multi-year, it just yeah. takes yeah. a while to put something together of this scale. And, uh, but at least it's not so long that you actually, like, forget that we ever started it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, we're going to keep pushing along, and if it, if it, you know, continues to make the economic sense for the town to do it, um, it certainly makes ecological sense, and it very likely will make the town, um, well, you know, a decent, very decent return on its investment, not yeah. just in electricity, but in cash. Yeah. Um, so, so that's where that is. It is moving slowly, but forward. Um, and um, let's see, <coughs> Jane um, has been, and I met with somebody from PV Squared. They gave us a proposal. Um, this is for the senior center now. <coughs> Thank you for the senior center. Did you center. see that? He sent here. this around. Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah. Um, <coughs> and it does say 24 cents yeah. on it instead of 11. But I think that's because there's an internal credit that you're going to generate the electricity and it can go toward not just the off-sale electricity, but I think, 
I, I need to look at that. There, the, may, there, there may be a reason for that. They uh, are the very, I mean, I don't think there's anybody who really understands what the electric company does with all these various rates. No. Yeah. So good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the next step is to get in, uh, another uh, installer or two to price it out and possibly um, come up with ways to put more panels on the roof that, you know, and, and, and within the budget that, they, that, that has been established. And so, um, to, to, so that, to that end, Rusty? From Northeast Solar. Yes. Was at the Aspargus Festival. Yep. yep. And Just we're gonna, a few. We're gonna, we're gonna ask. His him. booth was near the Plainville Farm booth, yep. and he said he's interested, available. He said that the market has softened a little, but they're still busy. Okay. Good. Well, he was going to be the next person we were going to ask for for an estimate from. Right. Right. So. So that is proceeding along as well. So is what this actually an estimate from Northeast Solar? Solar. Yes, it is, and that uh, would be the cost. Yes, but we want to we want to wait until we no, there's there's I, some I questions that. we have about the, the 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 price per watt that they have on there. Either either they made right. a mistake or they know something that they need to explain, right. explain to us. Yeah. On so is are there monies allocated for solar for we this building? We have money in our budget, the building budget. For okay, solar. so and we're working on the specific amount right now. We don't have that. Number. Do you expect, Jane, that you'd have to go back to the town and for no, a town meeting? for the building. Hmm. Okay. We're, we're good to go. Wow. All right. Money's there. Cool. And, and the town would like us to hurry up and use what we need to use so they can have the rest of it and not have the borrowing issue so they can... Sure. And my understanding is, from what you just told me, is that if, if the budget is $150,000 and it costs that much, Within a year, the IRS will send the town a check for about sixty thousand right. dollars of that because of the municipal tax return thing. Yeah, okay. which is really nice. Now, when we first looked at it, when the building was being built, that was not in play. But now right. It is. Well, is that part of the IRA bill that got passed yes. a few years ago? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so that money will come back to the town or to the senior center. That would go to the town. Yes. So, so the town will get a little shot. After, this, well, after that, too. Yeah, and I know as a private homeowner, um, the first two years that I installed the solar, um, I basically didn't have to pay taxes because we got the refund. We got one third back. It was amazing. Right, but so a municipality doesn't pay taxes. So, right? so we get they a credit, changed, right? They, they get the actual yeah. money. They give you, they give you not a credit. They give you cash, which is even better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. that's thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act that yes. was passed by Congress. So. Thank goodness they're doing this, otherwise it's just too hard. Yeah. We need it. Well, it's a real plus. There, There's no doubt. It just made it easier for us to consider it and to redo it and all of that. And this is great for all the updates. Thank you. Yep. for that tax credit is available if you want to do solar, if you want to do wind, if you want to do hydro, um, all kinds of alternative mm -hmm. energy sources get get a 30% credit right back from the government if you do it. Mary, are you good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Great. we will move on from 3.1 to 3.2. Trash cans near uh, trash cans near drive through restaurants. So it was interesting. So Popeyes, Popeyes and Starbucks both have a trash can right in the drive through it's got this big, like, almost like a spout on it. So it's, like, super easy to put stuff in there. Don't have to get out of your car. It's just right there. Taco Bell has... Must only be one, because I, I, I didn't specify. On the side of the building, but it's for people that are out of their car. Okay. It, it's not in the drive through at all. McDonald's has three trash cans, but none of them are in the drive through And they're in just randomly. One is kind of near the side door. <coughs> but who, who would have trash coming out of the door? Well, maybe the people inside, the cooks and things like that, if they're bringing Right, but it out. doesn't help. Yeah. Anyway, it's not the same as having it in the drive through where if you've got some trash in your car, you can just stick, you know so easily put it in there. At Wendy's doesn't have anything. Mm. No outdoor trash receptacles at all that I could see. 
So I don't know how we want to proceed here. If we want to write a letter. Well, my school year ends next week. And if you want, you and I can find a time and talk to the manager at Wendy's and just see. Well, and also McDonald's. And McDonald's because as well. These are the two that are near each other. Well, and I wasn't part of a trash pickup, but um, cleanup day. But I'm just wondering how much McDonald's and Wendy's trash you guys. The majority of things we picked up on the side of the road actually had Duncan written on them or were beer bottles Duncan and beer cans <laughs> and we did not see a lot of McDonald's we did not see a lot of Wendy's but you know we didn't do any kind of scientific survey of telling how many of each but we did the strip along North Maple by right, the horse farm weird. and down yeah and we didn't see a lot from there so we don't really do we have a good reason to contact them about their trash cans I'm, I'm thinking if we're not seeing their trash on the ground then you don't really have um, well you know I think we have a reason to okay. just to see if this can be a little bit better so I'm, I'm, I'm curious now but I didn't think of Dunkin Donuts I was just thinking of that area in Hadley well and there's a number of Dunkin Donuts all around I mean there's some in Amherst there's, there's some in Hadley right over there right so it's very easy to check it yep okay yeah. Now, are we talking about these trash cans just for the sake of the convenience of people having trash in their cars to throwing it away instead of driving down the road and throwing it out the window? Is that yeah. pretty much what it is, that, that convenience can? Yeah. yeah. To, to limit that and just to cut down limit on the trash. Um, just a side note, I, I do want to say that Susan Duncan, one of the seventh grade teachers over at Hopkins, um, had her kids do another a collection of signs. So she just Our let dogs. me know about that the other day, and that's pretty exciting. So we'll handle that between now and next meeting. Okay? How many signs did you get? I think she had the kids make five. Okay. Oh, yep. that'll be great. Yep. So keep thinking about places around town. You often know best on where they should go. Uh, there's one or two that looks like they might well be replaced from the very first set we put up. You might need to be touched up. Well, on that, um, you know, for the next few weeks, I'm not really doing much farm stuff, and I can go around and I can touch up some of the signs okay. to try to extend their life okay. a little bit. Okay. So, we'll see. Inventory for you. Yep. So, one issue that's been coming up at a few of these meetings, we've been talking about drainage ditches. So, CONCOM and Kayla, I believe, who is the CONCOM person? Um, said that they are thinking about having a meeting around June 26, June 27th, but she wasn't sure. She hasn't gotten back to me with a follow-up date. But she was hoping that in today's meeting we could brainstorm any questions that we have related to drainage ditches uh, for the CONCOM. So opening it up to all of you. Who are you opening it up to? To everybody here at the table. Okay. Uh, to the committee. I uh, just to see what questions you might have that we should be talking um, with CONCOM about. Also, um, Kathy and I are going to get together with Scott and Carolyn, so Scott McCarthy, Carolyn Brennan, later this month on this particular topic too. So we're... Uh, actually go look. To, at to go look going at on. some of these. So one of the issues that happened earlier is the um, access across private property. Right. Yep. And that, I think, is probably the biggest one. So it's access, are you talking about access across private property to town owned ditches? All right, so or? if the ditch run, here we are. Here's the ditch running right down here mm -hmm. between yeah. Jack's property and my property. Okay. It's not it's on one of the other's property? That's Probably not, but some may be. Mm -hmm. So it's too narrow for the town to come in from here. We have to come across one of these pieces of property. And Are we allowed to, to clean out that ditch in the first place? Depends on what it's used for. Uh -huh. If it was put in for agricultural draining, it is my belief. No offense, but if you still... Sorry. 
trying to get this. If it's agriculture, you're allowed to clean them, but if it was a general water flow ditch, no. <sighs> Makes For no instance, sense. For instance, we used to unstuff it, the ditch between stuff it and creative spaces. Don't touch it. Hmm. It's not a drainage is not super it. important. Yeah, of course it is. So how so is that a, a town bylaw or a state what part of it? Uh, that we that we're not allowed to clear out a ditch for drainage That's purposes? Conservation is state. So, so but the farm you can if it's are, agriculture. It's a very so, but isn't drainage oh, okay? But but also, if these ditches help other pro properties drain, not just farms, that's really important. So this would be that particular issue. Talk so to Congress Senator. Conservation can talk much better to that than yeah. I. So and so, so these so are that's a topic. Yeah. So these are some things that I have down for Kayla. Okay. So it's it's. Ditches that are primarily for drainage. Which ditches can be cleaned? Yeah. yeah. That's the question. And how do you define it? What is the... De it does one farm define agricultural ditch? Well, and also... Even it then runs through other property. Then there's the whole access. And then the access. Issue. So we don't... So how does that work? You started to talk about it and I so interrupted you. So if I say you can't go across my property, because last time you did it, you left big ruts and I didn't like it. No, you're never coming here again. You're trespassing, you well, can't do it. Can't the DPW clean up after itself? It's still you may have good. noticed that some people have developed an opinion and don't change it. <laughs> okay. So I don't ever want these people driving across my lawn because I got a ditch. Okay. And and what's more, even if you had a machine that could go down that ditch and bypass their lawn, they own the ditch. Mostly. Yeah. The town does. No. The people the who people own. But it. don't. But wouldn't it be worth it if they own the ditch, and clearing out that ditch would help lots of people's properties drain properly? That's altruism. No, can't we have some <laughs> kind of ordinance in town that like? This is a. This I, is, this I, that's an ethical. Well, and these are, these are these are good questions for the concom and seeing what they say. These are. I think th at the last meeting when these issues came up, it, I think it was pretty clear that you know, there are huge prop private property rights in the United States of America, and. It has nothing to do with the town or the con guy, whatever, whatever. If somebody owns something and they say you don't want to go on it, you can't go on it. Yeah. So really, the, the only way to address it, which is the way New York State addressed it, is that they had legislation mm -hmm. that said, you don't own that ditch anymore. Well, that's mm -hmm. what I'm talking about, is and that maybe we need something like that, that. And that's probably the way but to do it. that's not a Hadley issue, that's a state issue. That's I, state I realize yeah. that. Yeah. So if that's the truth of the situation, mm -hmm. then we would talk to Dr. Or, uh, Senator Comfort about that, right? So, yeah, well, the first thing we can do is talk to CONCOM and right. see if we can get some of these questions answered and go from there. I'm wondering, Jane, have you heard? Do you know, has anybody from CONCOM made it clear that they are planning this uh, meeting at the end of the month? I have heard nothing. I'm no longer their rep. <laughs> Okay. Before we get off this, sure. when you, we get off this subject, I have qu I have to, an addition about the concom that relates to the solar that I, when you're done. Um, now's a good time. Okay. Um, I forgot to mention that um, I, I did have to have a conversation with Solar Design uh, <coughs> a day ago, and they wanted some clarity on what the river protection setback is from the dump and my understanding is it's 200 feet from the river you can't do certain things and I don't know what those things are um, construction yeah a and the question is is this already you know if you already have a house that's 200 feet from the river you can do things to that house um, and my question is if it, you already have a dump on this property can you do things to that dump and well within 200 feet well, but the, if you have a house, you're not changing the use. If you have a dump, you're putting something on it. 
Probably. So there are so rules about change of use. what the setback Probably. requirement is. So we it would be we do need to go to the concom and just get some clarity right. about exactly what the setback is at 50 or is it 100? Because that will yeah. impact how they lay out the panels for this pre-app. Do you know Kayla at all? No, the uh, new I person. I do. You look okay. Good, yeah. uh, are you comfortable taking that question? Yeah. To yeah. To her. Sure. Okay. Sure. Well, if you want to give me an introduction for that, yeah. that would be great. Okay. Two hundred foot question. All right, and I will follow up with um, Kayla and just find out about the meeting and all that. Okay, next one up: Green Communities Grant. So remember, it's been a about a year since we went to the award ceremony uh, and we have the money and we've been working with Chris Desjardins he's the business manager for Happy Public Schools and here's what he said from this week he said we received a quote of forty one thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars to insulate the rim of Hopkins Academy that's the area where the wall meets the roof and they're submitting it to Eversource just to make sure that that's all right. We met with... Well, and also to see what kind of rebate yeah. we'll get. And uh, we're meeting with Lizotte Glass on Monday morning. That would be this past Monday. I haven't heard anything more. They were very surprised at the windows at Hadley Elementary and commented that they've never seen such sun damage um, and that replacing the sash of the affected windows and they're going to get us pricing for it. They also recommended sealing the doors and replacing a couple of them. Um, I'll reach out and I'll, I hope to have a quote by the end of the week, meaning maybe tomorrow. We'll also submit the quote for the windows and doors to Eversource in hopes of rebates and other things. So once he has all these quotes, we'll run it by Chris Martin. Mason. Chris Mason. And then is just make sure that it's approved by Mass DOER. Well, also there's a bunch of paperwork that Chris yeah. has to fill yeah. out. When Desjardins. You, when you say insulate the rim, does that mean there's no insulation in, in the rim right now? And Kathy, do you have any insights on I that? I have no idea. Okay. Um, Chris is unclear. But he just says insulate the rim of Hopkins Academy where the roof meets a wall, but he didn't say anything about what they have or what they don't. Insulation settles. That building's been here for a while. That's probably what it is, yeah. So, Kathy and I will keep you posted on what we find out and what else we hear. But this would be a wonderful use yeah. of well, that we'll grant. up at the next meeting. Yep. yep. And it would really benefit the whole town. Yep. Oh, right. The more efficient the building, less money it costs us. Yep. And Kathy, uh, can you go on and just mention about reviewing the climate action plans? And Has anybody you know? done any of that? Red. So, Marion, while you weren't here... I remember from two. Right, so we were going to each... Instead of everybody looking at Amherst, we decided it would be better... So I, I looked into who's got a climate action plan, who doesn't, anywhere around here and uh, listed them so we agreed that we would each pick a different town and go over their plan and then you know come back to the group when we've all done that and talk about not not the bits not their you know town respective stuff but the form you know the layout like the right, basic right, format right. like what's all involved mm -hmm. who all was involved how much did it cost all that kind of stuff and just at least come up with a framework that we can give to Carolyn and the yeah. select board like you know here's kind of what we need to start working on mm -hmm. so do we want to review who is taking what towns yeah so okay. I guess I said I'd do Amherst you're doing I had Northampton uh, yeah okay and Jack, you were... And I'll do East Hampton, and I took a quick look at it, but I need to get into it more. Um, did anybody uh, look so at Worcester? So, Marion, do you want to... I'll do Worcester. Okay. Okay. Michael, Beverly, Salem, Weston, New Bedford? I'd rather not do okay. that. I don't think I'm going to be much help. 
Okay. Task. He's kind of busy with yeah, the solar stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also not my yeah. strength. Okay. All right. So maybe by next meeting we will have all done that and we can talk about. So some of the East Hampton things relate to other things on the agenda. Um, I'm hoping that on June 24th to go to a meeting that they're having in East Hampton just about energy usage and things like that. Um, I spoke to the city clerk today and she told me where it would be. There's also a second reason and that has to do with this editorial from John Pepe. I'm hoping to meet him. He's on their version of this committee for the city of East Hampton. So he has some interesting things to say. Okay. All right, so that brings us to new topics. And I'm hoping that you can get the computer up and going and we can take a look. What are you hoping to see in East Hampton? I'm sorry. I'm so I'm hoping to uh, find out a couple things. First of all, just to hear some things that their energy committee is doing. So is this like a forum or something? Or? They're having a special meeting that day and it's open to the public and all of that. The second thing is I'd really like to meet this fellow, John Pepe. Um, he's worked at UMass for years he's been pretty active in the community and later on we will be sharing um, a letter he wrote that appeared in the Gazette. It was an excellent letter. Yeah. It was. Uh, and it's also pretty healthy to cross over with a committee like this and just find out what other communities are doing. You know, I don't know what Sunderland's doing, I don't know what Granby's doing on this, but East Hampton. Well, you can go to their websites. Some of them yeah. are a lot more informative than they've just got a more elaborate website, and and some towns do newsletters, which are yeah. all full of updates about yeah. stuff. Just it's a little bit of work. You got to go to their website. <laughs> do you know? Do you have it up? This I believe is it, and um, hmm, it, like looks, and it looks different. Okay. Well, but maybe the one we the one we have is about um, global six minutes long or so. I don't know if you can go back. Okay. What is this one? Okay, I don't know what this is. How the Earth was made. Okay, forgive me. Oh, that's all right. Um, here is your agenda, and here is. If you go you right to it, you know. It Ooh, should. That's his column. Yeah. It would be good to print that out for people. Sorry. Well, later on, I was hoping we could no, actually go down because there's a out. little red. If you go the there, YouTube click. Yeah, that's how yeah. you get to it. Thanks. Now, we are not saying that the world is going to warm up by three degrees. Th the Economist put it out there for everyone to see, and that's one reason we're showing it tonight. Hopefully, we get some yeah. sound here. All right, sound, lights, camera, action. The sound's action. on. Next to the gear on the right, make your No, the sound's screen. on. Keep going. And uh, make the screen big. To all, all the way. way. All the way. I don't yeah. think the sound, what makes you think the sound is on? Yeah. It well, it's not running yet. It says yet. it right there. I mean, it's not clicked. You got it's sound on? It, it, it is on, but. Hmm. No, it would be making noise here. Yeah. Oh. Mm, that's muted now. <sighs> I think it's on here. Uh, Hang on. We do need sound, guys. So let me mm -hmm. figure. Is out. your your sound is on? Does that need to be on? It was playing before. It was playing before. It was. Yeah, we uh, all heard it. I was. Oh. So did you mute it on on your computer? I may have. Hold on. Let me see what's going on. What's the date on this? Uh, this came out well, like a couple weeks ago. We popped on to a different video. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, you you uh, here you go. Come on over. We're here. wondering about getting the sound on here. Let me back up. Here. Uh, well, we, it was he accidentally was playing a little while ago, and then what did you do to turn that I on? I hit it with a sledgehammer, I think. <laughs> I'll 
I think you did something on your computer no, no, to turn no. the sound off. The sound. Yes. Oh. And if you can go back to the other video. Perfect. Let's see. Oh, cool. We were granted visas. Is it our most competitive relationship in the world right now? If you're able to go back to the agenda. I'm working on Yeah, you can get it right from there. And the other two, How if you can shut those down up top. Wearing a jacket or not. Right. In your day to day life, it may not seem significant. But three degrees of global warming. If you're able to make it bigger. Maybe turn it. Can it go any louder? Can you make it louder? Yeah. Three degrees of warming is really disastrous. The scary thing is, the world is its way there. Over on the left, I think. The Earth is warm between 1.1. And 1.3 okay. degrees Celsius. So 45. <laughs> 45. This is a problem that babies you pass in the street will have to live with. Children born today are up to seven times more likely to face extreme weather than their grandparents. If global temperatures do rise by three degrees, what would their world look like? It just can't happen. Rising sea levels. Desertification. Hollywood has always enjoyed imagining the end of the world. So this comes from the Economist like magazine. Clearly fiction. This film will show the scenario we all face unless more drastic measures are taken to stop burning fossil fuels. <laughs> In some parts of the world, the effects of inaction are already clear. The slums of Bangladesh's capital are filling up with climate migrants. Minara comes from Bola district, an area in southern Bangladesh. There, like many other parts of the country, rivers swollen by heavier rain and melting Himalayan glaciers are washing away people's homes. Many, like her, have lost everything. Many people are afflicted. Many short jogger or motona, gor, dor, bangania, sola, or moto time siluna. 1.1 to 1.3 degrees of global warming has already transformed Minara's life. It's one of the reasons why so many migrants like her are moving to the city each year, nearly 400,000 according to the last estimate. And climate models show there could be much worse to come. Climate scientist Yuri Rogov has spent the last 10 years modeling future climate scenarios for the United Nations. The models we use to carry out this exercise really represent the state of the art of our current knowledge of climate change and where we are heading. Yuri's projections use data collected by hundreds of scientists around the world. Here, this is the three degree level. And so there is uh, at least a one in four chance that under current policies we would hit three degrees by the end of the century. This is just one of the scenarios Yuri looks at. Another one imagines that all policy promises are kept. The most optimistic assumes that all promises have been kept and net zero targets are met. Where our best estimate ends up around two degrees at the end of the century, there is still a one in 20 chance that we end up with three degrees instead. One wouldn't be entering a plane if there is a one in 20 chance that the plane will crash. A rise of three degrees would affect everyone. Even wealthy cities and rich countries wouldn't be immune to the consequences. European capitals like Paris and Berlin would bake under more extreme heat waves. 
frequent storm surges in New York could turn parts of the city desolate. In many ways, cities um, magnify, intensify climate events. Cities are hotter than the places around them. They tend to be more um, vulnerable to flooding, and you can get a really bad event in a city in a way that you can't in the countryside. And because of their denser populations, disasters in a city affect far more people. Some cities might be badly prepared for the changes coming, but they have the means to adapt. Cities tend to be wealthier um, than surrounding places. They have a lot of amenities. A city that has taken seriously the risks of a three-degree world wouldn't necessarily be a worse place to be in a three-degree world. But a city that hasn't prepared for these sort of eventualities, that might be a really nasty place. So far, many developed cities have gotten off lightly. But some rural parts of the world are suffering disproportionately. <laughs> Smallholders, small-scale farmers, are particularly vulnerable to climate change, and there are over 600 million around the world. Smallholders with farms under two hectares produce around a third of the global food supply. Central America's dry corridor supports a mix of small holdings and medium-sized farms. Sandwiched between the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea, the area is prone to droughts. Israel Ramirez Rivera is a smallholder in Guatemala. Here, climate change is making the dry seasons longer and more severe. Digamos que esta esta es la más cerca, más grande que pudo dar esta parcela. He depends on his crops of corn and beans, but they're getting harder to grow. Las montañas a nuestros alrededores no nos tenían casi alimentos nutritivos. Nearly two-thirds of the smallholders in the dry corridor now live in poverty. Severe droughts in Central America are now four times more likely than they were last century. Muchas familias de acá, pues, a unos han intentado migrar en Estados Unidos. Eh, la desesperación económica, verdad, eh, incluso aparte de ventas, todo eso eh, ha motivado de que eh, los los vecinos de esta localidad emprendan su viaje. Migration from Guatemala to the United States has quadrupled since 1990. Now all of this has been due to climate change, but longer droughts would force even more to move. In a three-degree world. Annual rainfall in this region could drop by up to 14%. At three degrees, over a quarter of the world's population could endure extreme droughts for at least a month of the year. Northern Africa could see droughts that last for years at a time. But for some, too much water will be the problem. 10% of the world's population lives on a coastline that's less than 10 meters above sea level. For these coastal inhabitants, a three-degree world would spell disaster. By 2100, global sea levels could have climbed by half a meter from 2005 levels. Low-lying cities like Lagos would be especially vulnerable, with up to a third of the population displaced. And in Fiji, rising waters are already upending lives. You can see the graveyard there, yeah? uh, it's all under water now due to this uh, rising sea level and uh, climate change. The village of Toguru in Fiji is being swallowed by the sea. From the den, the village headman, 
has seen over half the village disappear. Relatives' houses have been abandoned and family graves are now underwater. There will be nothing by the government to relocate. But no one wants to relocate because we have <coughs> big, big grandparents down there in the sea. This is the place we've been brought up in. It's not easy to live. Past attempts to build a seawall haven't worked. But Barney sees building a new one as the village's only hope. If they do that, maybe we can save whatever is that. But if uh, we don't have the seawall, then it will be keep eroding. And time will come maybe in 10, 15 years, the world will be all eroded. Rising seas also mean storms cause more floods. And many more countries could suffer. The Philippines and Myanmar are just two countries that will also see an increase in storm surges in a three degree world. To escape, many will move, often to urban areas. Half the world's population already lives in cities, almost a third in slums. For them, a three degree world could be deadly. Minara has moved to Dhaka to escape the impact of climate change. But life could get even worse for her. Dhaka is getting hotter. In the last 20 years, the average daytime temperature has crept up by nearly half a degree. Days that approach 40 are now being reported. And high so-called wet bulb temperatures are on the rise. A wet bulb temperature is a measure of heat and humidity. Humans cool themselves by sweating. But in these conditions, when relative humidity is near 100%, sweat doesn't evaporate well. So people can't cool down, even if given unlimited shade and water. At a high wet bulb temperature, the body can't lose heat, and so it gets hotter and hotter. And the body is designed to work at a given temperature, and if it gets too hot inside, you will die. The human limit for wet bulb temperatures is 35 degrees Celsius, around skin temperature. Dhaka will have a much higher chance of reaching dangerous wet bulb temperatures if global warming reaches 3 degrees. You can't really adapt to that. You have to get out. If the temperature is so high that you can't work, can't do hard manual labor outside for significant parts of the year, then many places will become functionally no longer part of the economy. Jakobabad in Pakistan and Ras Al Khaima in the United Arab Emirates have already recorded deadly wet bulb temperatures. More of the tropics and the Persian Gulf, as well as parts of Mexico and the southeastern United States, could all get to this threshold by the end of the century. Climate modeling might show us the weather, but it doesn't show us its other effects on society. Established migration patterns could change. Climate disasters may exacerbate reasons people cross borders. Within countries, more people will move to cities. In a three degree world, tens of millions of people a year could be displaced by disasters made worse by climate change. When people are displaced by climate, they may well go to cities because cities are the places that attract people from the countryside already. A lot of people who can get to the developed world, not least because the developed world tends to be less hot, um, will give that a go. As migration around the world increases, there could be more competition for fewer resources. Water, already a highly contested resource, will be a focal point. Turkey's new Ulusso Dam has reduced the flow of water into Iraq. China lays claim to rivers vital to India and Pakistan. The prospect of a water conflict makes people very uneasy. China, back on many China! How national tensions would exacerbate those sorts of reactions in a three degree world is the sort of thing that no one should really want to find out. I think
think you'd have to be incredibly sanguine not to think that the sort of climate extremes that we talk about in a three degree world wouldn't lead some places to the brink of societal collapse. Those lucky enough to escape unrest would still have to adapt to a radically different world. People can adapt to climate change in all sorts of ways. One of the most obvious ones is air conditioning. But other ways to adapt at a local or regional level, I mean, one of the most obvious uh, is diversifying agriculture. There are physical things you can do, like seawalls. The fact that people can adapt and that adaptation will reduce suffering doesn't mean that it will eliminate suffering. Suffering is built into this whole process of heating up the planet. Adaptation will only get the world so far. The best way to deal with a three degree world is not to go to a three degree world. And that's why increasing efforts on mitigation are important. It's why working towards negative emissions that could bring down the temperature after it peaks are important. Once you get to a three degree world, you are in real bad global trouble. The scale of change needed and the slow progress of governments so far means three degrees of warming is uncomfortably likely unless more is done. Despite existing pledges, greenhouse gas emissions are still set to rise by 16% from 2010 levels by 2030. The need to act has never been clearer. There's still time to reduce emissions so that a three degree world remains fiction rather than becoming fact. Thanks for watching. To read The Economist's cover package on what a three degree world might look like, click on the link. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for playing that. If you can keep your computer open because we'll go to the Gazette article soon. Um, you know, one of my observations is a lot of the folks who work with us on the farm like you. Please support our um, are from Guatemala. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and you know, the other thing that's interesting is there are more and more states across the nation that are having real problems giving homeowners policies. Oh, yeah. Mm because they don't want to take the chance and a lot of these things are related to the warming of the world and some climate issues and some of that but um, I have a friend who's cleaning up after his brother passed away and he's down in Georgia and he no longer can get homeowners coverage for the house because he's in a flood zone or um, I'll or find out more I, I always, I'm going to see him next Monday and I'll find out more on why he couldn't but I think it caught him really off guard to see that he wasn't able to get a homeowner's policy on that. Well, and I just saw on the, you know, federal news, whatever channel I was watching, NBC, they interviewed a woman who, I think she said she lived in Atlanta, but I, I'm not positive. Anyway, a homeowner, she had homeowner's insurance, she had bad flooding so she used it and her yearly premium went from a thousand something to five thousand something so it's also getting really expensive mm -hmm. yeah. my daughter's in california and after the fires mm -hmm. two different big companies stopped insuring homeowners in california mm -hmm. Just so what do they do for homeowners insurance nothing there is none mm -hmm. therefore the bank won't give you a loan you can't scary collateral so if you're buying and selling a house can you even close on a property if you can't get a loan not unless you can pay cash and it's yours mm. wow hmm. i mean just on a local level next week it's supposed to be very hot tuesday wednesday i think it's 97 yeah. degrees already yeah usually yeah. we don't get that till like august senior center's cooling center from nine to four hmm. yeah it's good to know i will say all in all, this has been a really pleasant spring. Yeah. Although for the last half a month or so, we've been down on rainfall after yeah. being a little up early spring. Yeah. Um, down is better than up. Right. At least it's yeah. not flooding, and we right. are getting right. some right. rain. It's supposed to right. rain again yeah. tomorrow. We're supposed to get it. And yeah. we're lucky that we didn't have that that late frost that we did oh. last year. Yeah. yeah. There was Anyway, that was a pretty, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That was pretty powerful. Yeah. Uh,
Yeah. Well, actually, if you go to the YouTube, the econ the next one is pretty interesting too because it talks about even with the with the how much it's gotten hotter so far, the effect it having so many air conditioners is having. Sure. Yeah. So, Michael, I'm not sure if you can, but could you try to get that John Pepe yeah. a letter to the editor? So again, it's my understanding that he does the um, East Hampton Energy Committee. He's fairly new to it. Um, I had the city clerk pass my email over to him, <coughs> but he hasn't responded. Yeah. Oh, but if you just cross you it out. Two for your so I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping we can go around and read this. I think it's important to hear what he's saying. Okay. Partly, one of the inspirations for this is Tony, a couple of meetings ago, asked about this. Mm -hmm. So it's related to what he was mm -hmm. saying. So if you can go back to the top. Yeah. The story of the lost towns of the Quabbin Reservoir, Don't Quabbinize, Push for a Clean Energy, is a sad one, but it does raise the question of when an individual or a collective should be asked to sacrifice for the greater good. Development of the Quabbin Reservoir met the perceived needs of the large population of eastern Massachusetts for water, including the immigrant multitudes brought here to labor in our factories, fields, and our infrastructure projects. Yet the case of the wholesale uprooting of four central Massachusetts towns and their permanent inundation is a poor analogy to a state-appointed energy facility siting board with authority over the approval of 100 megawatt plus renewable energy infrastructure projects in a new, even-handed, and expedited process. <coughs> Still House Bill, um, unfortunately I can't, let me get a little closer, I'm sorry, no, I didn't bring my glasses. Still House Bill 4501, the Quabbinizer, doesn't go far enough in explic inexplicably omitting many critical recommendations of the Governor's Commission on Energy Infrastructure Siting and Permitting. Had H4501 incorporated key commission recommendations, it would have assigned the siting board jurisdiction for projects over 25 megawatts. A threshold still too far, far too high. For less than 25 megawatts, created a consolidated permit application, including consistent, comprehensive project review, cri review criteria to be administered in each of the state's 351 towns, set prompt time limits for local decision making, and allowed project applicants to, p to appeal to the siting board. And I, I just could basically what's going on is that mm -hmm. projects are just grinding to a halt mm -hmm. because there's all this due process. Yeah, malingering. And, and um, it's unfortunate. And there's so you, you keep going. No, if you there's more. If you, go, going if you scroll down. down. Yeah. Okay, it's there you go. There. Offered state technical assistance to local boards overwhelmed by project size. As climate movement leader Bill, Kibben, Bill McKibben has stressed, we don't just go live in a community, we also live on a planet where carbon crosses jurisdictional boundaries shortly after we spew it into the air. And so protecting one's backyard from any change has to be balanced against the cost it will impose on the larger world. What also crosses borders is the burden of oil and gas production and processing facilities, fracking, pipelines, and related petrochemical smog now shouldered by poor U.S rural and urban communities, as well as the global south, while we twiddle our thumbs about spotted salamanders and other immeasurable damage to possibly 75,000 sacred acres out of the state's 2.7 million acres of forest. Should we rely on 351 individual towns to make decisions that will determine whether we successfully reach the Commonwealth's 2050 zero carbon target? Uh, any more than we should rely on 7 million Bay Staters or Fortune 500 corporations acting primarily on their self-interest or personal preference to confront the head-on exist existential crisis we now face? Many objections raised about environmental damage and public safety threats from utility-scale projects 
are based on isolated incidents of solar permitting gone wrong. When the rhetoric and the dust settles after science has weighed in, more often than not the objections of the forest protectors are reducible to, not in by backyard, personal aesthetic preferences, or fear that change could damage property values. If you believe that we must not sacrifice 2% or 3% of Massachusetts for forest borrow for 30 to 50 years, borrow for 30 to 50 years, even though utility scale solar is faster to install and substantially cheaper than rooftop solar, you will also be apt to argue that forests are the only proven technology we have that can sequester carbon inexpensively. This is so far true, yet utility scale solar is so productive of ch clean, cheap electrons that the net carbon sink capacity of second growth forest pales in comparison to the electric grid carbon emissions mitigated by those same acres dedicated to solar util utility scale mm -hmm. solar. Nice. Can you scroll down to see if there were any public comments? No. Okay. Um, so, last meeting or the meeting before, Tony had raised his concern, but on the other side of the issue. And I didn't go out seeking this particular letter to the editor. It just popped up on May 28th. Um, and that's one reason I will try to see if John Pepe can come in and talk to us about this. It's just a very well written you know, presentation of the facts. I, it's nice to see that. There was an article in today, I don't know if it was in uh, editorials or an article, but um, what's your name? Coles, uh, another project where they want to uh, <coughs> clear cut 41 acres of their forest land that's, I guess, in a place where Amherst, Pelham, and Shootsbury meet. Yeah. And so it was kind of a discussion of that. And the person brought up not so much the taking down that, I mean, it's painful to take down trees, but that's kind of a small amount compared to the vast forest that Coles owns. But they were just saying, is this the best location for a big solar project? Like, is it close to a substation or the right? hook up to be doing it kind of out in the middle of nowhere like that. They wouldn't be doing it if there wasn't an inexpensive okay. substation or okay. that's line. I that's was that's wondering about that. Probably why it's going there is because there's probably a wire, you know, a big wire nearby. Yeah. They run up 63. What? They run up Route 63. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So in some ways, I had hoped that Tony would be here because I knew this was an issue that he was interested in. Um, but also the planning board in town meeting addressed this. Yeah. You know, we've well, and I think it's very controversial. I think what Shootsbury is dealing with, with lawsuits and all of this, and there's other communities, as you're pointing out, but Shootsbury, it sounds like they're right in the middle of this, of figuring out what to do. I mean, should a private landowner like Coles be allowed to put in solar or not? Well, the other issue is what he's pointing out is that blinders of only thinking about your own community and, yeah, taking down that many trees in the small picture, that's like a huge step to take. But in the big picture, like what this is pointing out is we need more solar like we desperately need more solar that putting up the right amount of solar will do more good than leaving those trees there to suck out the carbon from the atmosphere that the fossil fuels are putting there well yeah and in so many ways you know from where we started this meeting to where we're bringing it to the point of public comment um, you know I think we're advocating for solar whether it's on this building or the landfill, uh, and, and, and seeing above. if we can move it forward. Yeah. Because that will be an interesting step for the town. Can yeah. You this? yeah, so later today, um, and we can do this after public comment, but later today, if you just put in your <coughs> name, your position, which would be committee member, and 
but we actually don't have a term because we're a volunteer committee and we're we're not up for election. This is for the um, this is for keeping track of all the town boards. So we'll do that at the end. At this time, uh, we have the next 15 minutes allocated for public comment, up to three minutes per person. Please confine comments to topic relevant to this committee, and we open it up to all of you. Tom? Um, the current power system consists of electricity, oil, gas, coal, nuclear, and other. Uh, Electricity is produced by renewable and non-renewable -re sources. Massachusetts and other states are pushing for electric electrification of heating and cooling and transportation. But the current system has some positive benefits. After this meeting, you can jump in your car and by 11 o'clock you can be in Boston tonight. Or tomorrow you can hop on a plane and end up in Florida, Hawaii, or Alaska. How many people here live in houses that are over 2,160 square feet, or greater than 3,000 square feet, or greater than 4,000 square feet? It would be cost prohibitive, prohibitive to have an individual heat or cool a large house with electricity or heat pumps. The United States government is shutting down coal-fired plants by China continues to build and put in service new new coal plants. The Mount Tom power plant in Holyoke produced electricity for over 60 years. It is gone. The coal cars or hopper cars that used to haul coal um, are being used for long haul tr trash transportation. Other countries do not produce the waste this country produces. Other countries burn trash at high temperatures for a clean burn and it is a minimal uh, waste left over. This country likes to, likes to dispose of trash in landfill dumps. We preserve the trash for centuries and into the future. Like the federal deficit, it is in, an insult for generation to, generations to come. The government wants to elimin eliminate natural gas Why UMass has a designated gas line running to the power plant. Then there's electric vehicles. Hertz rent the car was a leader in investing in Tesla EVs. They're now selling off their EV fleet. Hertz lost a half a billion dollars on the EVs and even with the stupid Tom Brady ads, they could not lease them. Hertz is talking about potential bankruptcy. The EV division at Ford Motor Company lost $4.7 billion and two in 2023 and could put the company into bankruptcy. Tesla Motors does not make money building cars. They make money with their charging stations and the government contracts to put in charging stations. The power grid in the United States is not ready for a surge in demand. There is a real risk an overtaxed power grid due to transportation and heating conversions could cause power outages and blackouts. Like the 80,000 pages of the Internal Revenue Code, it is a burden on the U.S. economy, its citizens, and our standard of living. Be leery of rushing into electrification of our heating, or of our system. It could substantially lower your standard of living. Thanks, Tom. Anybody else with public comment? Okay. All right. Good so day. again, before you leave, if you fill that down uh, for the town clerk. So who's no, going to do got one. We got one. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> we got one. That's like a fish. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have large places or corporations like Kohl's building these solar things. Why to emphasize more solar for these houses to decreasing the prices? Because you're talking about why not sacrifice 41 acres for a solar field that someone's creating all this money for? What? So, 
Oh, anyway. Did you say because there were there was forty one? We're not supposed to discuss yeah. it. No, 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 no. no I, I want that we could have a dialogue that. But we're not allowed to. You can if you want to. No, we're not. We went to open meeting. A uh, lot training, oh, and we cannot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. we can listen, Everybody, but I can't say that. Everybody's pushing for the solar. I think it's you know it's okay if they would lower the prices for the solar. But you have someone like who is this Coles that you're talking about that has that 41 acres that they're putting in how big of a megawatt system that they're thinking about putting in. For whatever 41 acres is 25 megawatts they're, they're do you think they're really doing it for the sake of they're doing it for the money do you think they're really doing it for the environment knowing that they're going to be putting in a 41 acre solar farm they don't care they're about the money so if there is a way that they could lower the cost of what solar is for a residential house that would be more beneficial to everybody else instead of relying on people that are making all this money on the solar farm. If you have the money to do it, then great. But the pushing the solar, the killing 41 acres, then there's another 41 acres, and then there's another one 41 acres. What are we gonna sacrifice to getting solar because when the trees are gone, that's it. We're going up and digging up places just to having all these batteries. Digging them out there in Africa, whatever they're doing for the palladium or whatever they're making for these uh, batteries. So what are we sacrificing? Years ago, it was like, okay, don't kill the trees. We don't want to kill them. Now, because of our resources, it's okay to kill the trees because we want to make these batteries. Or we want to kill these trees to making these solar fields. I'm, I'm seeing kind of a hypocrisy here of, you know, do this, but don't do that. Yeah, if they could somehow give better rebates instead of putting on for you know fifteen panels is going to cost you sixty grand. So if they could make things m more cost effective to the homeowners, I think that'd be great. That you're wanting to, you want solar, you think it's a great idea. Homeowners can't afford it. It costs too much. And you were talking about. Um, you know, putting solar up on here, the difference between 11 cents or 23 cents, and I mentioned this before, when it comes to your fossil fuels and the stock exchange, you can see how much a barrel of oil is. It's 100 bucks a barrel. Am I allowed to ask a clarification? Oh, absolutely. Question? No. Who's going to pay to make it cheaper on your house? Who's going to? Who's going to pay for that? The reason yeah. it's cheaper to do it in a big field is because like farming versus gardening it right okay so right. who's, who's going to pay to to bring that cost down on the house you got a great idea i'd love to see it happen like, oh so would i too i mean if, if you know, after a while the supply stop. and demand if there's that many solar uh solar is being made why can't the cost go down so what if what if rebates from the government were only given to small people instead of corporations they're not the big comp the big ones don't require Substantial subsidies. They're they're nearly great. The they get they yeah. get the little houses way more subsidies right now than they do the big ones because the big ones don't need much of the subsidy because they're efficient. And that's what yeah. I was saying. <clears throat> you know, you can see oil's going to go up because it's over 100 bucks a barrel. It's going to be in summertime less production is being made. Mm -hmm. You're going to be in the mid uh, three and mid threes, three and a half. But with the power companies, you still don't even know what's going on between the 11 and the 23. They can raise and jack up the prices at whenever they want to, and you are at the whim of the power companies controlling what your consumption is and what you have to pay. That's what I don't like. So again, you know, we're, we're torn, and one of the last things on the agenda, just a reminder, watch the open meeting video. Uh, Kathy had sent you that link. That train. So it's really tricky with all that. So there's a couple things I can say, having just gotten a new system a couple of years ago. One thing with the Inflation Reduction Act, they go one third back as rebates. That was a huge saving. So that was a big, big help. The other thing that's really interesting compared to 20 years ago, I'm making three times the power on the solar on my house than I used to make. That's so efficient. And I paid the same amount 20 years later 
um, as I, I as I paid 20 years ago. That's the industry. Everything's all new, updated. Yeah, well, it, more, more efficient and cheaper. More efficient. It, it was cheaper because I paid the same. It didn't, you know, everything else is going up and up and up. I paid the same. And I'm making three times as much. And I got one third of it back in rebates. So there are certainly some incentives. <coughs> now when it comes to what's happening in Shootsbury or Amherst or Pelham or all these other places, I don't know, that's really tricky. I, you know, these towns are going to have to figure it out themselves because the state's not taking the leadership role in it. Not the, right now. The focus of that editorial was everything you said is true. People should get more help. It shouldn't be so expensive and all that. But what he's talking about is don't, like all that's the weeds. Don't get so caught up in the weeds that you end up not putting up enough solar somewhere because if we don't do that, the plant's going to overheat and we're going to all be in big trouble. So it's it's sort of like uh, that's it. That that's it. Well, and you know, some it's just to keep the big picture in mind that we, you know, yeah, somehow, it, some way, we need to get the job. Well, and done. in some ways, that's what the town is doing. You know, maybe it'll that's work out to put solar on this roof. Maybe it'll work out to put solar on the right. landfill, Probably and these are good spaces to put right. this. It, this right. all sounds great, but you're talking China, Russia, India. It's all about the them, the industry. So creating more so, uh, coal plants for production of uh, of money, right? Profits of, of supply and demand, making things, making the cell phones, anything that's plastic, all of when it comes to the. Uh, buy and trade mm -hmm. of all the other countries. We're willing to do all of this. I know it, it all sounds great. It's a great idea, but all the other countries aren't going along with it. So it, we're we're it's it, China right is doing right that we're having this idea. It's, it's doing a global this. problem. There's no we, doubt about okay, it. You're you're right. There there may be, but to getting everybody else that. You know, smog is everywhere. They're building these new gas and coal plants to more production. We're, you know, we're going against the wind. It's a great idea doing it. Ch China's building way more solar than we are. Right. And way more wind than we are. Be careful about what you read. Read a lot of things because there's a lot do, going right. on. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. Right. We're All right. Right. So, but yeah. not supposed yeah. to be yeah. after Michael. this meeting. No, I mean, I don't have a problem with you know yeah. a dialogue. I think yeah. it's great that a, we're just that not supposed to do it. Let's do it after <laughs> yeah. the meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. want to talk after the meeting. All right. So public comment is closed. No taker for next meeting. Uh, next meeting is what? what what's next meeting will be July 11th. I'll be, uh, I can do it. Okay. All right. Thank you for doing it again. And with that said, at eleven, at eight, twelve, this meeting is adjourned.